رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنذر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله إن الحمد لله تعالى Certainly all praises are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Who has blessed us with many of his great favors and blessings that we have with ourselves And until today Allah has protected our lives And alhamdulillah Allah has, has, Allah has blessed us with good health and his protection because my dear beloved brothers and sisters, what we are seeing today, it's unprecedented. Daily we are burying our Muslim brothers and sisters, subhanAllah. People we know very well, people we mix with, people we speak with. You know, many, many of our there, when people are dying, people are dying all around us. But on account of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see our Muslim brothers. We see our sisters, they are dying, one after the other. Those who are old are dying, and those who are young are dying, those who are sick are dying, and those who are healthy are also dying on account of this suburb and this cause. Surely Allah can cause and make the cause of death to be anything. So you don't have to be sick to die. But then when something becomes widespread, and the Sharia shows that it spreads and moves from one to the other, then there is a reality and truth in it. We Muslims believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cause and the control of every single thing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has put causes for certain things to happen. And when those causes take effect, then it becomes effective. So therefore, Jibreel alayhi salam, it in the authentic hadith, in the very beginning, in the very, very beginning, uh, the angel of death used to come in the form of a human being and take the soul of people. Narrations have that. And then the angel of death complained to Allah and said, oh Allah, then people will hate me. <laughs> people will say, I am taking their soul. I am taking. So they will pinpoint me as the one who is taking their soul. So they will begin to hate me, like how the Jews hated Jibreel alayhi salam. Why the Quran says that? That they hated Jibreel alayhi salam, but they believe Jibreel alayhi salam is the archangel, the greatest angel, the angel of revelation, the angel that brought revelation to their prophet Musa alayhi salam, prophet Moses. But why did they hate them on account of which Allah revealed in the Quran? Man, man kana aduwa li Jibreela. Whosoever is an enemy to Jibreel, Allah is an enemy to them. It is so because whenever people transgressed and disbelieved in Allah and started to fight against Allah, fight against the message of Tawheed, Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam to destroy those cities. So their forefathers who were destroyed at the time of Dawood alayhi salam, and then at the time of Lut alayhi salam, when Sodom and Gomorrah and five cities were destroyed, Jibreel alayhi salam was commanded by Allah to destroy. So they were blaming Jibreel alayhi salam for destroying their forefathers and destroyed. But that was upon the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, the angel of death, he said to uh, Allah, oh Allah, then if people know I am the one who is taken, they will hate me. They won't like me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith, it says that Allah said to him, I will create causes for that. So they will attribute their death to the cause of that and they wouldn't call you. They wouldn't say angel of that came to me. They will attribute it. Someone will die from this. Someone will die from that. Someone will die from the other one. He had a heart attack. He had cancer. He had this. He had that. And they will attribute it to the causes and not. But the reality is that the angel of that comes to extract the soul. 
but the soul, the extraction of the soul, and the death that actually comes about is connected to causes, subhanallah. So there is no cause, so then you will live on. When there is a cause, somehow you will die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends adhab in different ways. The adhab is a cause also for the death of people. When Allah becomes angry because of the disobedience of people and Allah wants to shake the earth with an earthquake, then the earthquake becomes the cause for the death of the people. When Allah hits an area with severe storm and hurricane that destroys, that becomes the cause. When Allah hits people with an azab called drought or famine, then out of starvation and hunger and scarcity of water, they die. Animals die, birds die, but that is the cause for the, the lives that are lost. So, so too, this which we call the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a real thing because I don't believe anybody will play dead. I don't believe that. Subhanallah. And sometimes you are close to a near one or you can see the person that is grasping for breath. Lost the breath, can't breathe. If you can't breathe, you will die. We survive on oxygen. We survive on by the will of Allah, isn't that so? But we need oxygen. We we we, we live by the will of Allah, isn't that so? But if your heart is taken out of your body, you can't live. Allah is the one who gives life, but He has put the heart <laughs> so that the heart will pump blood and oxygen, you will live on. Maybe somebody kidnap you and took away your heart to sell it to another person for a heart transplant. You, do you think you will live? You can't live. But Allah has the power to make you live, isn't that so? Because he's all powerful. If somebody beheaded you, you wouldn't live. We believe that. But yet we believe Allah can cause life to exist. But this is the extent of our belief in causes, isn't that so? That the head is on the body, you can live. The head is severed from the body, you can't live. Subhanallah. The heart is on the body, you will live. And if the heart is taken out, you wouldn't live. Subhanallah. Person, his two kidneys fail. Subhanallah. Then eventually he passes away. After many days of dialysis, he will give up. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause many different things to be causes. And this is what we are seeing and experiencing now. With the search, not only in patience, but in death also. Throughout the world. Subhanallah. And uh, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, something like this occurred at the time of the Sahabas. In the year 1888, 18 age means 18 years after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in 11 age. We are talking about only seven years after his death. An incident, the plague of Amwas took place, which in Arabic is called Ta'un al-Amwas. Amwas is a village approximately 20 or 22 miles away from Jerusalem. Umar radiallahu ta'ala was the Khalifa. Many Sahabas were still alive. Many Sahabas were still alive. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala sent his soldiers and army towards Syria and Philistine to enter that land. And while they were going in Amwas, close to Jerusalem, the plague broke out. The plague, it is called the plague of Amwas because it took place in the village called Amwas. And that village called Amwas is a place, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus also, he did his propagation also. Because in that section, he was, he was living and working in Palestine, in Jerusalem. Those were the areas that many of these Israelite prophets resided in. Subhanallah. And when that plague struck, it became an epidemic. A plague actually starts from an infection. A rodent or an animal or something. But it's just like an a, 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 a epidemic. It becomes widespread. It kills people by the thousands. If it becomes worldwide, it becomes a pandemic. So the plague was an epidemic at that time. And that plague started to move like wildfire. Healing out people one after the other until 25,000 of the soldiers of Umar died on account of that plague. How much? 25,000. Subhanallah. In that, the great Sahabi Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah died, great companion of the Prophet. He died in that plague. 
After him, many sahabas included the great companion Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala. We always read about Mu'az bin Jabal, narrator of hadith in Sahih Bukhari. He lost his life in that plague. It struck them. So who are we speaking about? The sahabas, the greatest after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum. About them Allah says in the Quran radiallahu anhum wa radu an. They are so great that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. They are so great that 10 of them in the world Allah promised them Jannat while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was still alive. They are called in Aqidah Ashara al-Mubashara. The 10 promised ones of Jannah. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced to them. Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Usman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah. Ten people he counted in front of the sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum. The Asharam. Such people who were so great in the sight of Allah. Who were so pious in the sight of Allah. When they became touched with the cause of death, they also fell. They fell to the plague. Before they entered, they were just before Amwas, before the village of Amwas. Umar radiallahu ta'ala had left Medina to have a meeting with them. And he called the great commanders, all the sahabas, and he had a meeting with them. He said, this plague has broken out, I want you to return to Medina. Do not enter into that land. Do not go to Jerusalem and pass through Amwas. Don't do that. Some of the they were sahabas, Umar was a sahabi, but Umar was the khalifa. He was the amir al mu'minin So some of them listened and they came back to Medina, although they were in the army. And some of them said, <laughs> we are going, we can't leave those Muslims down there to die. We have to go and help them. And they entered and they were struck with the plague. 25,000 Muslims, sahabas and tabi'in from the greatest of the ummah, they died. So the plague, Allah mentions, and it's about this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari. He says, whenever a plague hits a city or a village or any territory and you are outside, he said, do not enter. Because you are throwing yourself into the valley of death. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَا تَحْلُكَ do not put your hands into destruction. If you know something can harm you, don't go and do it to test Allah's kudrat. And see if it's for me, it will happen. Subhanallah. Would a person drink poison and say, if it is my time to die, I will die and drink poison? Inna lillah. That's, fu that's stupidity. That's not sense, that's stupidity. It's not allowed for anybody to test Allah. You are putting Allah to a test. Because you say, okay, Allah, I believe in you. I'm your servant. Let me see what you can do. Inna Allah. Who can do that? That's kufr. Putting Allah to the test. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran has identified what is halal and haram so we may eat and consume and use halal and stay away from haram because haram is harmful to us. Allah doesn't want us to harm our bodies. This body is an amanat from Allah. It is a trust given to us. And it is our duty to preserve it and protect it. That is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the sahabas doing certain things, he said, no, do not do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this life, you have to preserve it and protect it. You are accountable to Allah for this. If you cause harm to your body, Allah will take you to task. Therefore, the Sahabas died in that. So it goes to show that incidents of this nature touched our great pious predecessors, the great Sahabas, and what happened to them, it can happen to us also. When there is a widespread disease, be it a plague, or what we call the pandemic now, a flu, a virus, and it is spreading and taking effect on people, and taking lives, it will do that to anybody regardless of race or religion, and that is what it is doing. Our deen tells us to take precaution. Our deen tells us to take that which is necessary to protect and preserve your health. This is why the Prophet wasallam, before he ate, he used to ensure that he washed his hand. Why he washed his hand? Think about it. 
You can go if you are doing any chores or anything and thing and time for food, you go and eat and eat. Somebody says, why didn't you wash your hands? Suppose there are germs or bacteria and you eat. You can say, well, if I am to get sick, Allah will make me get sick. If Allah will protect me, but that's foolishness. Why did the Prophet ﷺ wash his hand? He will always before he can wash his hand, wash his mouth and eat. And when he finished, he will do the same. If he drank milk, he will wash his mouth also. There was no one who made more miswak that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam always used in the twig to brush the teeth. Subhanallah, which became a very powerful sunnah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to use white clothes. It was his sunnah. You know why? Because white is the only color clothing where you can see dirtiness the fastest. There's one speck of black, you will know it's dirty. You'll wash it. If you were black, you can wait for a month, you wouldn't know it's dirty. Isn't that so? Because the color doesn't change. <laughs> Subhanallah. We look in the seerah, the hygiene of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even in his eating habits, Hafiz Ibn Al-Qayyum, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti, the great Mufassir of the Quran, they have written books on the medicine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His meal was well balanced. Whenever he took dates, because dates is heated, it has a lot of heat in it, he will ensure he ate cucumbers or he ate, me ate melon. Because the melon and cucumbers is cool, so he balances himself. He says, when you eat, do not overeat. Divide your stomach into three parts. One third for food, one third for water, and one third for you to breathe. If you fill your stomach up, you can't breathe properly. We know that. Don't, don't overeat. Don't eat before you sleep, he said. Don't do that. If you happen to eat, he says, walk so you will digest your food. All this is what? Hygiene and health. Every single thing. Every single thing. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us. He said, when you are drinking from something, you didn't drink it, cover it. Don't leave it open and then come back to drink it. Anything could fall into it. He says, when you drink something, don't breathe into it while drinking. And don't drink like a camel, drink in sips. When you drink one dung, you put pressure on the digestive system. Sip and drink, sip and drink, subhanallah. Okay, don't breathe in, anything can fall from your nose. And then you will have to drink it. And then if anything remains, nobody will want to drink it. So the reason I'm saying these things is that when we look in the seerah and the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will see so many teachings that, that people have not yet discovered, the scientists. In minutest detail, even he spoke at length. He says, when you, like you are married and you have relations with your wife, do not go to sleep like that. Wash yourself, wash your private organ and make wuzu before you sleep. But if you can't make wuzu, at least while you wash your private organ because the bacteria and germs can remain on your private organ and you can get sick, you can be infected. This is from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1400 years ago, where people still today who are non-Muslims, they don't know about it, so they sleep like that. On their body, germs and bacteria. Even nobody but Islam has taught this, that when women have come to the end of their menses, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, they must, it's for us to take a bath. It's not up to them, it's compulsory, they must take a bath. But people who are non-Muslim will say, well, I'm clean, I, I look clean, I don't have to take, well, why do I have to take a bath? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told women, wash your private organ properly. And take a full bath. Open your hair and take a full bath. Because you were in the state of major ritual impurity. You have to come out from that. So our deen connects with fitrah. This is why Islam is called Deen al-Fitrah, the religion that connects with your nature. This is your nature. You as a human being love cleanliness, you will find that in Deen. Deen, Islam tells you about cleanliness. You as a human being know about hygiene, Islam gives you the best hygiene, subhanallah. In every single thing, every one after the other, Allahu Akbar. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very healthy. He was very strong. He was very conscious of his health. Always moving, exercising. Subhanallah, he never loved people to become obese. He used to tell the Sahabas about that. This is very unhealthy. He himself spoke against it. Take care of your health. 
It's the greatest. He said the greatest gift you can have after Iman is good health. Beg Allah for good health and preserve your good health. The Prophet said. So my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, we see in the very lives of the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala, radiallahu ta'ala anhum how they were affected. So it means that, yes, that which Allah has made the cause for that, which we have today among the many causes, is the, the moving pandemic, the moving COVID-19 that is touching one after the other and our family members are dying on account of it. Our friends are dying. Our brothers and sisters are dying. Babies are dying. Everybody because it is moving and it is real subhanallah. So therefore as Muslims, we have to do what Islam teaches us. What the Holy Quran says, La bi tahluka. Do not throw yourself into destruction. If you know something will be destructive and harmful, do not do it. A place has it, don't be there. Life is in your hands. In other words, Allah has given you that responsibility to protect yourself and take care of yourself. And whatever you do or you do not do, you will be accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must not just allow it to pass that whatever will happen will happen. Yes, everybody knows that. Nobody denies that. But what, what about you? What did you do as a Muslim? As, as given by Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to help yourself, to protect yourself, to protect your family member, to do what is right according to the teachings of Islam. Did you follow? Did you disobey? Subhanallah. So that's one very important thing we, we need to know. And as we see, it is rising every day. The numbers are increasing, subhanallah. I'm sure you may have heard about people and it shock you. Such a young person, such a strong person, such a doctor, you know, fully vaccinated. Subhanallah. Whatever it is, Allah knows best. But we are seeing something in front of our eyes. We have to take care. We have to take precaution. That's one thing we have to do. And the other thing we have to do, which is the more important thing, is when we see things like that occurring, my dear brothers and sisters, then any time it can happen to us also. Many people may have been vaccinated, but we have seen that a lot of brothers and sisters who are vaccinated, they have actually succumbed. They have died, they got infected. So therefore it means that anything can happen to us also. You know, you can get sick. I could, whether it is from the COVID-19 or not, we can get sick. But as I said, this is what is being, what is spreading now. This is widespread. This is what is hot. This is the thing that is moving more than anything else. Any other sickness may touch you and then after a while you may actually fall sick and then become more sick. But this within one day and two days and three days you are gone. That is what we are seeing. Brother is healthy, three days time. That's it for that brother. That's it for that sister. Subhanallah, people we know well. So therefore, it means we have to be prepared also. Prepared, prepared for what? It is taken life, so we have to be prepared for what? Death. On one occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he buried somebody. And he moved away from the grave and sat at the edge. And because of that, that he was weeping so much. That Barra bin Azib radiallahu ta'ala and the Sahabi who narrated this tradition as recorded by Ibn Majah in his Sunan. He was weeping so much that the tears fell on the earth and it wet the dirt. So much he was weeping. And then he turned to the Sahabas and he said, Limithri hadha fa'iddu. He says, Ya ikhwani, Ya ikhwani, Limithri hadha fa'iddu. Oh, my dear brothers, oh, my dear companions. For the like of this, prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves for death. No man knows when that will take him. No man knows when he will go. Stand prepared for death. Always be prepared for death. You have buried him today, but your turn will come. When will your turn come? Allah alone knows. Every day the angel of death visits people. Who will he visit next? When will be our turn to be visited by him? When will he take our souls and return to Allah with it? Whatever is happening, would that happen to us? Subhanallah. Would that happen to us? When, if it will happen to us? All these different questions come through our mind. Those people who have passed away, sometimes people leave this world and they, they do not get any time to prepare for the meeting with Allah. They leave this world and they get no time to prepare for the meeting of Allah. 
But if we know one day we have to meet Allah, then Islam tells us, the Holy Quran announces to us that we should always be prepared for that. We should always be prepared for that. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he spoke about an intelligent person, someone who is wise and intelligent, he said, al mandana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'd al The most intelligent man and the wise man is he who takes a stock of his own self. He checks himself. He checks his actions. He checks to see what he has achieved in this life and what he has prepared for the hereafter. Mandana nafsahu, who takes a stock of his own self, wa amila lima ba'd al maut and he prepares for the life after death. That's the intelligent man. An intelligent man, he knows that he has to return to Allah. He doesn't know how much, how much more years he will live on the, on the face of the earth. That he's doubtful about. Would I live one day? Would I live one year? Would I live 10 years or 20 years? I do not know, the man says. But what I do know, I will one day return to Allah. That is sure. Allah calls that yaqeen in the Quran, certainty. You are doubtful about your life here. How long? When? You are doubtful about that. You cannot be doubtful about that. That will surely take you. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran to be prepared. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us. In that hadith, he told us about the intelligent man. What is his intelligence? How is he wise? How, how is he filled with wisdom? It's when he always, every single day he lives, he checks himself. In other words, a man doesn't live like an animal. You see the life of an animal, an animal get up, gets up in the morning. The animal goes about its business. The animal gets some food to eat, will eat, get something to drink. A, you know, a small pool of water will drink and, and then the animal will fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> By your house, on the road, on a step, in the jungle, the animal cares nothing. The animal is not concerned about anything. Then the animal will sleep. The animal will get up the other day, look for food again. Okay? The animal doesn't know where it's going to get food, but it will get, will survive. Believers don't live like animals. We have a goal in life. We have a purpose in life. What is that purpose? Allah tells us in the Quran, if we forget, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ He says, O oh, my servants, I haven't created you for any other thing except you will serve me. That's your goal in life. To live your life. Enjoy what I've given you to enjoy, but your life should be lived to serve me, subhanAllah. Not to serve anything. You have a purpose in life, in other words. You just don't live helter-skelter, moving from right to left, where the evening takes you, you spend the night. You have an objective for living. You have something ahead of you. You have a purpose for living. Life is not purposeless. That when you give up on everything, you think you can kill yourself and commit suicide because it's not, living, it's not worth living for anything. There is a purpose for your life. This precious thing which Allah has given us called life, it's valuable in the sight of Allah and it should be valuable to us. So therefore, we know that we are living for some higher objective, subhanAllah. We are living to please Allah. So we just don't live helter-skelter anywhere it swings, you know, that it doesn't bother us. No, no, no. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, why are we here and what are we living for? So Allah, He tells us in the Quran, after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned to us about the wise and intelligent man, he said the intelligent man and the man filled with wisdom is he who takes a stock of himself. Check yourself. What did you do today? What do you hope to achieve tomorrow? Check yourself. Where are you going? What is your destination in your mind? Have you reached there? How far are you away from that? What do you hope to achieve? Do you know you have to die? Yes. Are you preparing for it? No. Well then what's the problem? The Prophet says, take stock of yourself. Check yourself. You have lived 50 years already. You want to live 50 more? And when 50 more comes to you, you want to live 50 more? 
What do you think? You wouldn't die? You will live forever? You are healthy there? You will think you will always be healthy? You think you will never become sick? You think Allah will never test you? You think you will never enter into the grave? You think you'll never go into Barzakh? Think for yourself, the Prophet is saying. Take stock of yourself. Know who you are, what you are, where you are going and where you want to reach. That is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling. Just don't live today for today and when tomorrow come, you will see. You live, you are living when you die. You, people say when we die, we'll see about that. No, you can't see about it at that time. Subhanallah. When we die, we'll see. No, there is no scene at that time. You have to see for there from here. <laughs> Subhanallah. If you have to see, you have to see from here, not there. She wouldn't get that chance. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is why, after mentioning to us, mentioning to us who is the intelligent and wise man, he says, "Well, Aaj is the fool, the foolish man, the stupid man, the idiot is him." nafsihi wa tamanna ala Allah. He who follows his base desires, he does whatever he wants. He's living like that. He has no purpose in life. He's not living to please Allah. He is following his base desires. But he has a lot of hope in Allah. Oh, Allah will forgive me. Allah will grant me Jannat. You know, when I die, so and so will make dua for me. When I die, so and so will do prayers for me. He has a lot of false hopes in Allah. He's doing nothing. He is not worshiping Allah. He is not serving Allah. He is living his life carelessly. He's donkey damn about his life and his future. He doesn't pay attention about when he will die and when he will enter the grave. So he lives like that, following his desires. Whatever his mind tells him, he does it. He's not thinking about changing his life's pattern. He's not changing about straightening out himself and making an Islam and amending his own actions to better himself as a believer in the sight of Allah. He thinks he's alive today, tomorrow he will be alive and the next week he will be alive. He's healthy today, COVID will never touch me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't become sick. No. He thinks like that. Whatever comes in his heart, he's going behind it. But when he's asked about Allah, don't you fear Allah? He says, no, Allah will take care of me. You don't worry that. Allah will help me. The prophet says, that's a fool. Only a fool behaves like that. An idiot and stupid person behaves in that manner. Because if you have good hopes in Allah, do the things that will actually cause that to be fulfilled. Subhanallah. You want Allah to help you? Help yourself. Subhanallah. You want to help Allah to bless you? Serve Allah. Worship Allah. Be obedient to Allah. So my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, with all that is going on around us on a daily basis, subhanAllah, you get a note, you get some forwarded message, so and so will pass the way, you are shocked, subhanAllah. How? Oh, he died out of COVID. It affects everybody. <laughs> if we have a heart, we are not stones. So we are affected naturally. We are affected. Subhanallah. But what happens if that, that is actually about us? Information is being forwarded. So and so was here and he passed away. He became sick within two days. He passed away. The question is that the passing away is there. Are we prepared to meet our Lord? Are we prepared for that? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in this hadith, prepare for this day. Prepare for the day when you will die. And that preparation is not a minute before death or, or when you die. That preparation has to occur before that. So therefore, we beg Allah, we beg Allah to protect us. Protect us and give us good health. Protect our lives and our family lives, the entire Muslim Ummah and all others. May Allah protect us. It's for those of our Muslim brothers and sisters who have passed away, may Allah grant them Jannat. May Allah forgive them. May Allah use the sickness that He has placed upon them to wash away their sins and their wrongdoings. Because it is a very serious thing, my dear brothers and sisters. It is based on what has been said. It's going to become more and more serious. So we have to take steps and we have to be very careful because Allah will ask us about what we did and what we do also. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, keep us on the right path, Give us the strength and the ability to understand his beautiful teachings so we will always do that which is right.